angels waging war in the unseen realm. Global events fulfilling biblical prophecy. Eternal life. What lies beyond mortality? From analyzing the paranormal from a biblical worldview to the discussion of cutting edge science and technology, conspiracy, discovery, special investigative reports. Unafraid to explore the challenging issues facing humanity. Welcome to another edition of Skywatch TV. Hi folks, this is Tom Horn again, coming to you from the studios here in Missouri at Skywatch TV. And once again, so privileged to be able to have my good friend Steve Quayle in the studio with me. Hi Steve. Hey Tom, it's really great to be back and to take the next series of amazing events and amazing fulfillments of prophecy and our mutual uh, investigations and research expeditions going on concurrently unknown to either one of us. The only time we find out what <laughs> each other is doing is we do radio interviews together. So now we're beating that. We're doing a jump step. We're doing it on TV. <laughs> yeah, but it makes me wonder what next is going to happen between the two of us. Maybe we'll talk about that in a moment with Timothy Alberini. Okay. Uh, project. We're going to be talking mostly uh, today about this book that you put out recently called True Legends. And I love that title, by the way, because, you. Uh, you know, we have these legends throughout the United States of America, throughout the world. Everybody seems to have their mythos. And yet there's such commonalities in the stories that were told that seem to attest to a time when there really were things that were going on in the world that involved giants and things like that. So we're going to talk about that in just a moment. But first, speaking of giants, uh, I learned recently that Timothy Alberino, who is your partner in crime, your partner in filmmaking, he's, he's been producing a whole lot of just world-class uh, like many documentaries that you guys are putting up. So maybe what's the name of your film company? Gen Six, G, uh, short for Genesis Six Productions. Yeah. And and uh, you know, thanks for bringing it up because Tim just got back. Today's what the twenty first, twenty second of. Uh, what month is this, April? <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, I keep strange hours, but Tim just got back from a three week trip to Peru, and we had a fascinating fascinating series of events that happened, and obviously Skywatch will be airing it, but what we're up to pretty much, Tom, is we're tracking down the giant cover-up that's taking place on multiple uh, continents, multiple cultures, and I think I can explain to people the number one question that the doubters and the skeptics have, well, where are all the skeletons? Well, Tim just returned from Peru and fascinating. He was at Tiwanaku, he was in Bolivia, and he said in Bolivia, they're undertaking a new dig and the Bolivians just announced a whole new pyramid mm -hmm. uh, find. And what's fascinating is no matter where Tim has been in the last three months, Sardinia, obviously in Europe, uh, Peru, uh, Bolivia, and a couple points in between, the, the fascinating thing is, number one, they're always followed Number two, everybody they, in, they interview that's, let's say, over 75 years to 80 years has a common, uh, uh, if you will, statement of who comes in to grab all the artifacts, especially when it's giant related. They're talking about helicopters landing at night. They're talking about uh, big helicopters lifting very heavy items. And in Peru, for instance, one of the amazing things at, at a place called Sakayama, Saksayama, I'm probably not pronouncing it right, but the fascinating thing is, is that they ran into an engineer that, who is a secular engineer that said the ancients had to have had a way to liquefy the stone because the stone in some instances flows in and pours in together, just like you and I, you know, playing with Play-Doh, mm -hmm. fitting piece A to piece B. Now this is a secular engineer, but fascinatingly enough that every place that Tim went, they were followed most of the time. It didn't matter if it was in Sardinia, the hush hush, there were people that were actually afraid to go on camera, we had many times we could only record their voice because they were afraid of them. And interesting, them was the Vatican. Well, obviously, if anybody knows the history, and you well know, but of, of South America, Latin America, and even different parts of Europe, there's a absolute stranglehold 
on true artifacts and true history. But what was, what was mind-blowing to both of us and even the people that accompanied, whether they were translators, a film crew, is just how uh, touchy anybody was for filming. It was okay if you filmed on the right hand, but don't go over on the left hand. The right hand was like I would call staged artifact. Some of the most famous artifacts you see on the ancient alien series and all the different, they've been moved from a place where they really made sense to a place where they don't make sense. Tim said an interesting thing. Tim said, it was like, Steve, you could see the pre-flood building mm. and you could see the post-flood building. They'll let you see all the post-flood building you want, but they won't let you see the pre-flood stuff. In Bolivia, they were met by armed guards carrying machine guns. So that's what we're up against. Now, now this is important, Tom, for your research, too. There are people working overtime to, with, to keep the truth of what is really out there in true history. I said in an earlier interview, they who control the past determine the future. If you and I are only told three points on a 12-point uh, uh, instruction to follow, we don't do good after maybe four or five. Mm -hmm. We're going to mess it up. So by keeping people in the state of, I would call, uh, I've got to be really careful here, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I call mainstream media vomit brokers, okay? <laughs> so by them only giving... And, that, and that's being careful. That's being careful. <laughs> that, that's, that's the best I can do. You know, either that or I have a mouthful yeah. of soap. The point being is, is that it's... They want to regurgitate uh, 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 some facts, but most fiction, into the narrative, whether mm -hmm. it's, it's anything that you and I talk about collectively. Yet when you go to the desert southwest, you and Chris go down there, Chris Putnam, or Tim's going here, or I'm going to a, a Native American reservation, you'll find out that there's a whole different world out there that these people who lived and their ancestors chronicled it, and people absolutely see the Norway spiral, but they can't accept the fact that, gee, how did the Native Americans, or how did, uh, you know, 4,000-year-old civilizations, why do they all use the universal symbol? Uh -huh, right. And now, now, but now this is also part of a documentary uh, right. or a series of a documentaries. series of documentaries. So tell me about that. What you're, you, what you're doing, of course, is kind of producing documentation and in documentary format of a lot of stuff that you already have been investigating for some time on the presence of uh, giants, but also even like you, you talk about Amaruka, if I'm saying it right, like the, the, the whole origin of how America got its name, and the Freemasons even write about this, don't they? Talking yes, about they do. Where, where the knowledge of the mystical schools came from. Here, as it what came from the plume serpents? The plume serpent, Quetzalcoatl, Viracocha, both in the Aztec and Mayan uh, history. Uh, the plume serpent, Amaruka, or uh, A M E R U C A. That's what the South American and the high cultures called America, and that's Land of the Plume Serpent. Now, when you see pictures of Quetzalcoatl, you know the classic representation is a feathered serpent. Mm -hmm. Almost looks like basically uh, uh, the reptilians in the old science fiction movie V mm -hmm. with a whole bunch of feathers. I know mm -hmm. that's simplistic, but that's what it is. So by finding out where all of these customs that came in the United States. There was a time, for instance, where people, even the major anthropology magazines, never wanted to admit that the Native Americans necessarily in the desert southwest were cannibals. Mm -hmm. I remember fighting that argument 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. So the point being now is, or the Anasazi, the ancient ones, which you and Chris, you know, have talked, or the alien ones. What what is the central theme in all these, by the way, is cannibalism. Mm -hmm. Now what we're seeing in the headlines is cannibalism. You're seeing it in all shapes and forms, whether it's the Christian, our brethren in Syria being slaughtered and basically uh, uh, cannibalized, their meat sold for meat in the market, and the world, especially the Western church, is silent. Mm -hmm. That makes me just go, I said this, the customs of the ancient ones will come into the contemporary times, and you'll know we're in the end times. And that's exactly, now, people didn't, there was very little cannibalism 20 years ago. Maybe the case of the airliner that went down mm -hmm. in the Andes, you know, and, uh -huh. and situation survival. But there was never, you know, basically cookbooks on the Internet and people advertising for people to come and basically let someone kill them, as in the case of Germany, and eat them. It's interesting because, you know, you, you mentioned me and Chris had been doing, again, 
investigative work, not even knowing you were working on uh, this this brand new book, True Legends, where you're taking the stories that have been told by many of the American Indian tribes and the legends of the stories. I want to ask you in a few moments about the Smithsonian. Don't let me forget to ask you about that. But while you were doing that, we were um, actually going to the Four Corners area. Chris went down to the, uh, you know, to the southern end of the Anasazi Trail, as I started calling it, in Sedona. And what does he find there in Sedona? But the presence of the Vatican, you know, had built, uh, and 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 in an area where nobody else is allowed to build, they get to build this um, kind of Catholic thing. It's a church. It's a monastery sticking out of the side of the mountain. We found the same thing on the top of Mount Graham. Everywhere there seems to be these portals and these entities, it's like there's a very strong presence there, as if they know something we don't know, or they're pursuing something ahead of us. But the point I was going to make is I got a chance to sit down with Dr. Don Mose, and he's a third generation medicine man. He is, uh, he's an academic, or he's a retired academic in the Navajo Nation. I should have brought his book and showed it to you where he had an artist depict giants that used to be in the United States. Some of them that look like they're 200 feet tall. It took whole tribes to bring them down. Mm -hmm. And when they finally got them down and cut their head off, there was so much blood that came out, it flowed down into the valley like it was forming a small river. This is in the books that he had written. Well, here's the interesting thing. Thing. I'm, interest, I'm, I'm interviewing him and I ask him, so tell us what happened to the Anasaze? And he starts, you know, telling the tale that they hear in school. Well, there was a drought and then the seven years of a drought, they follow, you know, they start migrating slowly away. But I raised questions about that. I said, and yet when the archaeologists first went into those cliff dwellings, they found that they had disappeared overnight. They didn't slowly migrate away. They left everything, bags of salt, that would have been like gold, right? Uh, so where did they go? Well, he looks at the camera. We have this on film. And he says, well, I shouldn't tell you this, but if you were to ask my great-grandfather, this is a story that he would have told. And, and, and Steve, it was like he had opened up True Legends and started reading because he talks of a portal, the serpent deceiver that comes through the portal, the six-toed giants. But he also says that this deceiver started teaching the people cannibalism. That was my whole point. Mm -hmm. They started eating one another. The giants were eating them. We did follow-up research that isn't even in our book where we found old university archaeological digs where they found Anasazi that had literally been ripped apart. They found their bones, the sinew, the flesh had been literally ripped apart and left on the ground. The rib cages split. Yeah. Well, it's funny you would say that, Tom, because, again, this, this illustrates it. In, in the book Long Walkers, uh, a pilot who was an active duty Air Force pilot uh, flew into Bagram Air Force Base, I believe, in the year 2005. And uh, I know him personally, came to my store, bona fides, verified, etc., and told the story. Now, you just talked about being ripped apart. Well, he was tasked with flying a dead giant who had cannibalized a squad of Marines that were going in looking for Bin Laden's boys, you know, Al-Qaeda in the caves and everything. And interestingly enough, the very description that was given to the team that basically produced the giant uh, cadaver for him and takes a special way of killing giants, he said it was like their rib cages were ripped apart. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? So you're in the desert southwest, talking to, to that, that, that very intelligent man, and his grandfather, I would tell you this, would know more about the truth than all the twists. Well, Do Dr. Mose is a third generation Navajo Nation medicine man and oral historian whose right. books are used in their, their, schools. their schools. So yeah, he's no Johnny come lately. I think the big discrepancy between fact and uh, fantasy is, is that as the older generation dies off, this is why Tim, I mean, he's sitting on a reed uh, uh, island in Lake uh, Titicaca, okay? And he's interviewing, a, I think is it like a 75 or 80-year-old man who only speaks the language that has to be translated into Spanish. Now, Tim speaks perfect Spanish and lived in Peru, so that helps. Mm -hmm. But it's always the same story. So they're talking about the helicopters coming in, talking about cannibalistic giants, and how's this for an interesting story? They go to a place called Ameramuru, which is a Stargate location, an actual Stargate. So they have shamans there, and they're 
ringing a bell and they're taking a like a metal object and and like you would take your thumb and make a crystal glass hum they're basically making all these different noises now i've been told by the people that know a lot about this stuff that stargates work on words sounds and a power source i never found out what the power source was but while tim Vinny and benny those are the three guys and the crew are, are camped out at the Stargate. It rains, it mm. hails, they've got this on video, and he said it was the most strangest thing they've ever seen because around them, everything was clear, but right where they were was, if you will, this directed hailstorm. He said it was, it, it was so furious that they had to go and get half the village to come and pull their car out and dig their car out mm. of the mud because uh, you know, basically they had gone up there to see this event but the strangest lightning, the strangest sound. So what am I saying here? I'm saying that in your findings and our, our, our corollary investigation research, the common denominators are always the same. I, I'll, I, I think I've told you this before, I mentioned it on the radio. I was contacted by a major film studio years ago, five, three or four, maybe five years ago, and they wanted to know if I would be willing to make the Giants rewrite a movie script that I had written and, uh, you know, basically making the Giants nice people. <laughs> And I said, well, I said, fee fi fo fum. <laughs> I smell the blood of an Englishman. Doesn't sound to me like they're eating burgers, okay? Right. So the point being is that even Shrek, uh, there was a cartoon, and they made Shrek. An ogre is a human eating monster, mm -hmm. O G R E. Yeah, not Congress, because there's some of those guys, too. Those just eat the fruit of the land. But the point being is, is that we're, we're seeing now in the corollary the corollary investigations that we're doing, the common denominators. And the Anasazi, you know, it's fascinating. You jump to Easter Island now, and Easter Island used to have a curse. And the curse was, your grandmother's flesh lies rotting in my teeth. You know, lovely, huh? That was mm -hmm. a National Geographic. So there's been a cover-up. Because, again, what's troubling to me is, is that I see the parasitical appetite of demons coming into common acceptance. I don't play video games, I can honestly say. Uh, I, I don't think I've ever played one more than two minutes, and then my attention span was <laughs> over, and my manual dexterity is not what it used to be. I, I was teasing you about Joe. I love the way he plays the guitar. Yeah. You know, my thumbs and fingers don't move that fast oh, yeah. anymore. But the thing that's fascinating to me is, is that the theme in these video games is getting darker and darker. Do you know what the number one selling comic book and, and cartoon series is in Japan. It's about man-eating giants, mm. okay? And these are like 200-foot tall giants. So when you asked me earlier what's the difference about this Genesis 6 uh, revised volume versus the first one I wrote, is the Woods document, it, it, they're 200, 300, 400-foot giants, especially Polyphemus. That goes right back to the Cyclops. That goes right back to Jason and the Argonauts. It goes right back. And the Greeks, you know, for instance, one of the, uh, well, two ancient wonders of the world was, uh, oh, good night, the Colossus of Rhodes. That was just, uh -huh. that was 99 feet, and it, it spanned the harbor. Then you have the Temple of Zeus, which is kind of a portrayal on uh, Genesis 6 giants. And that was a real temple where real giants sat. Uh, you know, and held court. And these guys were in their 40 and 50 and 60 foot tall. So while Paul Bunyan and all those stories may have been dismissed, when you found out from your Native American contact, and I'm hearing the same thing from my contacts around the world, because when you and I go on talk radio, it goes all over the world. Mm -hmm. And millions of people listen, and we'll hear from Australia, we'll hear from Siberia, we'll hear from all over the place. I mean, I've heard people say, we listen to you on satellite radio, and I said, you mean like serious? He said, oh, no, we're on satellite. We're getting you from the satellite downlink. So they must be in some research facility or have some capability. But those are the kind of people that make contact with us to give us the leads we follow up. And so I think it's time. I, mean, I, I refer to this over and over. It's time for those hidden things to be revealed. And again, the people of God have nothing to fear. Now, if they know what's coming and we're articulating it, defining it, and preparing them for it, then they will deal with it in victory versus in subterfuge, defeat, and total panic.
We've been talking here with my good friend Steve Quayle. You can see why I love talking to Steve, right? Uh, how do you do this with no notes? I mean, you have a mind like a steel trap. Uh, right now, we've been talking about the book True Legends, uh, and this is one of your newest books. This just only came out just a few months a, ago. No, no, that one came out about a year ago. About one year yeah, ago. Yeah, Little Creatures about Little six creatures. months ago. Actually, this is even newer than that, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, and that's new. That's like two yeah. weeks old. Little Creatures. And then uh, Genesis 6 Giants. This is actually the, the um, what is this, a third edition or it's your new edition? It's, it's an a expanded? It's a new edition, but if it were going by the old line, it would be the... It would be the tenth printing of it. Okay. So, so uh, but we're making all three of Steve Quayle's books available uh, to you at a very special price. We're also throwing in the. We typically uh, retail this for thirty dollars. Volume one of the Researcher's Library of Ancient Texts. This is the Apocrypha, but it has many of the books that you'll find sourced in uh, Steve's books, like the Book of Enoch and some of the other ancient uh, works, like Jubilees, which also talks about the giants, also talks about the return of the giants and Absolutely. the fallen angels. Uh, normally these books all sell for $40 each because they're two to three times as big as anybody else's works. That would normally, between those three books and the Apocrypha, that would be a $150 value, but we are making that available to you during these programs only for a special price of $99. If you call in uh, the number that's on the screen or if you visit skywatchtv.com, you will be able to um, get these books from our online store. If you call in, just tell them that you're looking for the Steve Quayle package, the Steve Quayle special, and you'll get all of those books for the special price of $99. Of course, we have each one of these available in the store for sale by themselves. If you want to buy just Genesis 6 Giants or the new Little Creatures book, I'm sure that we'd be happy to make those available to them uh, too. Well, uh, Steve, we, we've got us about uh, five minutes left here, and I, there's a question I just keep wanting to get to. Let's go for and it. it. And it's, it's the question of the Smithsonian. Uh, in, your, in your book, right towards the very beginning of True Legends, um, you tell a story that some people are familiar with, probably most people are not familiar with. Um, some people just call this the great Smithsonian cover-up. Tell me about that. Well, first of all, the Smithsonian was basically founded by a man named Smithson, obviously where you get the name Smithsonian, and he hired a gentleman named Powell, for instance, who was a, a pretty well-known uh, uh, expedition leader, Lake Powell is named after him, but he became the curator. He suffered from a thing called isolationism. He wouldn't allow the thought that there were other uh, civilizations and or people that had the ability to, number one, travel by ship. He thought that everybody grew up in an isolated uh, uh, area. And, you know, some people call that isolationism. Uh, some people call it uniformitarianism. But that's as opposed to diffusionism, where everybody went everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to remind people that the Smithsonian, from its very beginning, had, had the official party line that was pretty much established by Powell. And he would not allow any conflicting evidence, although I do quote in there, there's one quote of his that basically says, I can't account for this stuff outside of, you know, a more advanced civilization and culture having generated. In other words, he denies everything until the very end, and then he says, but I can't account for it. Everyone is familiar with the classic scene in the Raiders of the Lost Ark, where obviously at the end, you know, after the Nazis and after the retaking of the Ark, and it's put into a crate and it's being taken down this uh, massive, massive, huge warehouse on a, on a forklift and just placed in some indiscriminate spot in the warehouse out of the eyes of everyone to see. The reason the giant bones, now here's, here's the bottom, here is, is, I would say, the definitive statement. The reason the Smithsonian does not allow the truth to come out on this is because giants would indicate that the biblical narrative is accurate and would totally, to totally undermine Darwinian evolution, okay? 
And if you know the history of anthropology, there are times when the anthropologists believe that the Piltdown Man and some of the Peking Men and all these anthropological supposed species that existed, uh, you know, they had the jawbone of something and they built a whole mythological creature around it. Well, if they can believe a lie then and perpetuate that lie and then only grudgingly admit it was false, what makes us think that, that, that they, they're telling the truth about anything? Good example. We're now seeing NASA. There was never water on the moon. Now there's once water on the moon. Mm -hmm. There was never uh, water on Mars, yet they're finding there was water on Mars, you know? We're seeing all these hints, and you and I have talked about it, the alien agenda. Here's what's key. In every area that you and I have investigated or will investigate, wherever there's a military base, Tom, wherever there's a Catholic uh, presence heavy, those are mystical, and there are also electromagnetic contact points, like Sedona, good night. They consider that one of the most important vortexes or power centers between dimensions in the world. Well, that's what Timothy Alberino and the film crew were down in Peru, all over Peru, basically tracking down. And I would say this, if you go out and it's a bright blue sky, you camp out in front of a known stargate, and all of a sudden you've got an isolated uh, weather war against you, obviously somebody or something was not happy with the presence. I, I won't say it's a supernatural thing, but it's certainly an unusual thing, and even the natives couldn't figure that one out. Yeah, and you know, deities try to emulate God so that how uh, Israel in the Old Testament would follow God and they would follow the cloud, right? Correct. God created what we could almost explain in chemistry, but he did it miraculously so that they would follow it. And the demons always try to emulate him. They always try to be like he is. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will be like the Most High. This is what they want, right? They Absolutely. want to be worshipped as gods. So it would make great sense. In fact, in True Legends, you talk about the storm gods. And so there's, 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 there's mythology and storyline that go around that whole concept since forever that would make you then wonder. Timothy goes down. He's, he's with a group of people. He's in an area that's supposed to be a portal. Beautiful weather all over the place, and a storm just decides to come right over the top of them and have a hissy fit because they are there. Of course, electromagnetism. Uh, they can read that in the ground, like you mentioned, Sedona. It's off the chart. Uh, and that, of course, can also play a role in our weather patterns. We, we've only got 45 seconds left in this program, so I'm just going to have to beg you if you can at least come back one more time. Uh, we thought we would do two shows, then three. I think we're going to have to have a fourth show, if you will. I'll do it. Okay. Uh, folks, once again, wonderful being here on the set at Skywatch TV with my good friend Steve Quayle. You would think that with all of the years of and hundreds of hours of radio that you and I have done together that we would have been in each other's presence before. But this is actually the first time that we've sat down next to each other. And this time I couldn't be happier to have him. And Thank we're going to, and when the, and when the Timothy Alberino, Steve Quayle, Gen 6 products uh, become available, you'll see them here. The supernatural realm is real, and we humans are naturally curious about it. That's why there are so many television reality shows featuring ghost hunters and alien chasers and mediums and psychics. Now, by and large, the Christian church avoids these controversial topics, even though we have the authoritative book on the subject. That's our mission at Skywatch TV, is to address issues of the paranormal and the supernatural from a Christian, a biblical perspective. But we depend on your support to do it. To find out how you can support Skywatch TV prayerfully and financially, please log on to our website, skywatchtv.com. And keep watching as we keep watch at Skywatch TV. TV. Yeah, but it makes me wonder what next is going to happen between the two of us. Maybe we'll talk about that in a moment with Timothy Alberino's okay. uh, project. We're going to be talking mostly uh, today about this book that you put out recently called True Legends. And I love that title, by the way, because, you. Uh, you know, we have these legends throughout the United States of America, throughout the world. Everybody seems to have their mythos. And yet there's such commonalities in the stories that were told that seem to attend to a time when there really were things that were going on in the world that involved giants and things like that. So we're going to talk about that in just a moment. But first, speaking of giants, uh, I learned recently that Timothy Alberino, who is your 
partner in crime, your partner in filmmaking. He's, he's been producing a whole lot of just world-class, uh, like many documentaries that you guys are putting up. That's what's, the name of your, what's the name of your film company? Gen 6, G, uh, short for Genesis 6 Productions. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, thanks for bringing it up because Tim just got back. Today's, what, the 21st, 22nd of uh, what month is this, April? <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, I keep strange hours, but Tim just got back from a three-week trip to Peru, and we had a fascinating, fascinating series of events that happened. And obviously they ran into an engineer that who is a secular engineer that said, the ancients had to have had a way to liquefy the stone because the stone in some instances flows in and pours in together, just like you and I, you know, playing with Play-Doh, mm -hmm. fitting piece A to piece B. Now this is a secular engineer, but fascinatingly enough that every place that Tim went, they were followed most of the time. It didn't matter if it was in Sardinia, the hush hush, there were people that were actually afraid to go on camera, we had many times we could only record their voice because they were afraid of them. And interesting, them was the Vatican. Well, obviously, if anybody knows the history, and you well know, but of, of South America, Latin America, and even different parts of Europe, there's a absolute stranglehold on true artifacts and true history. But what was, what was mind-blowing to both of us and even the people that accompanied, whether they were translators, a film crew, is just how uh, touchy anybody was for filming. It was okay if you filmed on the right hand, but don't go over on the left hand. The right hand was like I would call staged artifact. Some of the most famous artifacts you see on the ancient alien series and all the different, they've been moved from a place, you see Skywatch will be airing it, but what we're up to pretty much, Tom, is we're tracking down the giant cover-up that's taking place on multiple uh, continents, multiple cultures, and I think I can explain to people the number one question that the doubters and the skeptics have, well, where are all the skeletons? Well, Tim just returned from Peru, and fascinating, he was at Tiwanaku, he was in Bolivia, and he said, in Bolivia, they're undertaking a new dig, and the Bolivians just announced a whole new pyramid mm -hmm. uh, find, and what's fascinating is no matter where Tim has been in the last three months, Sardinia, obviously in Europe, uh, Peru, uh, Bolivia, and a couple points in between, the, the fascinating thing is, number one, they're always followed. Number two, everybody they, in, they interview that's, let's say, over 75 years to 80 years has a common, uh, uh, if you will, statement of who comes in to grab all the artifacts, especially when it's giant-related. They're talking about helicopters landing at night. They're talking about uh, big helicopters lifting very heavy items. And in Peru, for instance, one of the amazing things at, at a place called Sakayama, Saksayama, I'm probably not pronouncing it right, but the fascinating thing is, is that where they really made sense to a place where they don't make sense. Tim said an interesting thing. Tim said, it was like, Steve, you could see the pre-flood building mm. and you can see the post-flood building. They'll let you see all the post-flood building you want, but they won't let you see the pre-flood stuff. In Bolivia, they were met by armed guards carrying machine guns. So that's what we're up against. Now, now this is important, Tom, for your research, too. There are people working overtime to, with, to keep the truth of what is really out there in true history. I said in an earlier interview, they who control the past determine the future. If you and I are only told three points on a 12-point uh, uh, instruction to follow, we don't do good after maybe four or five. Mm -hmm. We're going to mess it up. So by keeping people in the state of, I would call, uh, I've got to be really careful here, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I call mainstream media vomit brokers, okay? <laughs> so by them only giving... And, that, a, and that's being careful. That's being careful. <laughs> that, that's, that's the best I can do. You know, either that or I have a mouthful of soap. The point being is, is that it's... They want to regurgitate uh, 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 some facts, but most fiction, into the narrative, whether mm -hmm. it's, it's anything that you and I talk about collectively. Yet when you go to the desert southwest, you and Chris go down there, Chris Putnam. Angels waging war in the unseen realm. Global events fulfilling biblical prophecy eternal life.
What lies beyond mortality? From analyzing the paranormal from a biblical worldview to the discussion of cutting edge science and technology, conspiracy, discovery, special investigative reports, Unafraid to explore the challenging issues facing humanity. Welcome to another edition of Skywatch TV. Hi folks, this is Tom Horn again coming to you from the studios here in Missouri at Skywatch TV. And once again, so privileged to be able to have my good friend Steve Quayle in the studio with me. Hi Steve. Hey, Tom, it's really great to be back and to take the next series of amazing events and amazing fulfillments of prophecy and our mutual uh, investigations and research expeditions going on concurrently unknown to either one of us. The only time we find out what <laughs> each other is doing is we do radio interviews together. So now we're beating that. We're doing a jump step. We're doing it on.